Hi, everybody. Welcome to Custody Matters Live. My name is Danica Joan and my co-host, Bud Vino. Today's show is going to be absolutely amazing. We have Dr. Michael Bone. He is a, he's a consulting psychologist and his sole focus is on the problem of parental alienation. He's been doing that work for like over 25 years and, um, and he is going to be one of our speakers at our upcoming April conference, Guardians and Gatekeepers Conference. Welcome, Dr. Bone, to the show. Oh, thank you. Bud, this is your time. Step in. Jessica, thank you. Well, first of all, uh, February 26, 2020, 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, air date of the show. Myself, Bud Bino, along with the host of Custody Matters Live, brought to you by the Dad Talk Today Network, Danica Joan. Uh, and yes, as Danica has said, we have an amazing show in store for you folks. Dr. Bone is here in the flesh, and it's going to be an amazing and empowering and educational show. Danica, let's get rolling. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, uh, so Dr. Bone, tell us a little bit about your background. Tell yes. us, uh, we're going to be talking about your background. We're going to talk about what's, what's important to you and what's important to, you, to our viewers and uh, you participating in the conference coming up. Wonderful, absolutely. Well, I'm a psychologist. Uh, I am in, uh, I had a, starting out, I had a normal practice like most people do. I would see somebody at nine, somebody at 10, somebody at 11. And after, with, with years passing, I began to become involved in uh, custody issues. And in that context, I became aware of the whole problem with parental alienation. It was to me shocking in so many ways, just like it was originally for the guy that first described as Richard Gardner. Uh, so, in the process of that, I wrote a couple of articles with an attorney uh, about just about the dynamics of how this operates. And, and I think related to that, then I got involved in other organizations. I was on the scientific advisory uh, committee with the, for the uh, Parental Alienation Research Foundation in Washington, D.C. And that's where I met some of the pioneers in this. I went up there for a meeting in D.C. Not quite a few years ago, and that's where I met Richard Gardner and, and Richard Warshak and all the other people that we now are very familiar uh, names with us. So as I got more involved in that, the focus became more and more exclusively that. And then about 15 years ago, after doing evaluations and testimony and things like that, and trying to get the court to understand this, which is very, very difficult to do, that's counterintuitive, we'll talk about that. But, as, but about 15 years ago, I basically closed my clinical practice, stopped seeing patients. And then I had already begun just doing consultative work with attorneys, trying to get attorneys to understand how to best present the story to get the judge to understand how serious it is and how uh, it, it's, it really is counterintuitive. I mean, what it looks like on the surface is not at all what it is. And so that's quite a, a trick to be able to get the, uh, uh, the judge to understand that. So I became really focused on how's the best way to tell that story and to kind of break it down. And, and there is a formula to do that. And so that's what we've had uh, some good uh, su success with in, in pretty hopeless situations. So it's, there's, it's, there's no guarantees, but it's a, it's a process that has sort of evolved. So that's what I do now is purely consultative. The vast majority of what I do has to do with litigation, how to get the court to understand this, like I said before. Um, and there are a number of things that make it difficult. The counterintuitive thing is one, but also Family court judges, and I've heard them this articulated many times, they're basically trained in, in judicial colleges and so forth, that whenever there's a conflict in a marital situation, a custody matter, it's really both parents that are contributing to it. So that's the default setting the judge has, is that, oh, these two people, and I've heard judges say this, these two just hate each other more than they love their, their children. Uh, and sometimes that's true, but in these cases, that is not true. There is a perpetrator and there is a victim, and that, but that, that, that's not apparent. I mean, the judge comes into it with this vision that it's, oh, both people are, are contributing, but in a real parental alienation case, you have one parent who's doing the opposite of what they should be doing. I mean, a Florida statute in every state in the country basically has the idea either explicitly memorialized or at least implicitly understood that the court favors the parent that will uh, that will support the, re the relationship between the child and the other parent. That's critical. We know when, when you have a divorce with that going on on both sides, the, the effect of divorce on children is far, far less. Uh, but in the case of an alienating parent, this is not just doing a bad job at that. 
it's doing the opposite of that. It's actually sabotaging the relationship. So getting the court to understand that is really one of the key things that we, uh, that we, that's one of the first steps to, to, to get the court to begin to remedy it in a way that actually will work and make a difference. You know, this is interesting because a few months back I went to a conference and Dr. Jennifer Harmon really spelled out the, the power and control wheel. So some of you might be familiar with the Batter's Intervention Program, the power and control wheel, yes. and where it's the, a batterer quite different from domestic violence because in domestic violence education, it, it's kind of assumed that you're both beaten up on each other. There's no loss of power. Uh, where the person is feeling helpless. However, in the batter, the batterer's intervention program, it's very clear. One is the controller dominator, like um, it's targeting the helpless victim. Yes. And that's how I see the difference between a lot of these parent, these these contentious uh, squabbles in the court and parental alienation is truly a targeting a helpless victim. Yes, it absolutely is, and that's important. But again, that's not apparent. If you think about when you think about what happens in a courtroom, the the person in the courtroom that knows the least about the case is the judge, and that's purposeful. That's because of the the rules of uh, of evidence uh, that basically restrict the information that the judge can have. So, if they have that default setting that both people are responsible, you have the alienating parent who comes across typically pretty smoothly and accusing the other parent of in some way being dangerous or out of control or crazy or something. So you have that parent presenting that way. And then on the other table, you have the parent who has been targeted as they're, they're traumatized. So they, if they show that, which they're likely to, that tends to confirm what the other parent is saying about them. So the, now the judge begins to no longer see there's a victim and perpetrator. Now it's two victims and two perpetrators. So that's what we have to get the judge to, uh, to recalibrate how that how that looks, and there are ways to do that. Um, so that's what we kind of focus on is is getting the judge to understand that there really is, uh, like you say, there's a dis, uh, disproportionate, profound disproportionate relationship of power. I mean, the alienating parent is in in control of everything. We also know that in severe cases, the incidence of personality disorders is very high, and the ones we see all the time are antisocial, borderline, and narcissistic. And one characteristic that all three share is the inability to step outside of oneself and critique one's own behavior. Now that's, that's a pretty big deal if you think about what that means. Every time a person like that gets into conflict, they always believe that they're the victim and they believe it too. And they become very persuasive you know, to adults, but especially to children. So this is just sort of rewrites history and modifies it in, in, in that way. So those people that have those disorders that tend to engage in these kinds of behaviors uh, really do uh, oftentimes believe the distortions that they uh, put out there. They may have originally sort of distort things a bit, but then they very often do tend to believe it. I mean, I've had, had situations where we had clear evidence of an event that happened, and we've got the person who was describing this, who was an alienating parent, to take a polygraph. And the polygraph came up clearly. Just the, the person was describing something that was not consistent with external reality. But as they described it, the polygraph read no deception. So you know there are exceptions to this, but but that's what we're dealing with. So they're very persuasive uh, in in what they uh, in what they put out there, and that really infects the children's view of that parent as well, especially. And that advances when the contact is cut off, and the, that other targeted parent has less. Uh, less FaceTime with the children, so to speak. I don't mean FaceTime in the Facebook place sense, right. but I mean uh, just the time in the same room, so to speak. So, yeah. Dr. Bo I'm sorry, yeah. Dan, if I could quickly. Dr. Bohm, that being said, it's important. In, in our conversation we had with Dr. Evans last week, he, we touched on that subject of uh, the alienators maybe not even realizing and believing it themselves. So that being said, if I could ask you as a, in your professional opinion, if you've got somebody with that sort of mentality, how should how do you uh, propose their consequence if they believe well, what they're saying? I mean, that gets to the next part of how do you get the court to understand what's going on? And uh, the really, the, here, here it is. Here's the punchline. <laughs> you basically put your energy into exposing the behavior of the alienating parent. That really is what the whole, because right prior to that, the other parent who's the targeted parent is, you know, 
portrayed as being dangerous, crazy, whatever. So the, 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 these cloud of suspicion is hovering over them. So you have to change that. And the best way to do that is, you, of course, you have to show that the accusations against the targeted parent are false. But very often, the second step is not taken. And that second step is to say, not only is this not true, what they're saying about this parent, but what is true is this is part of an ongoing pattern of false vilification. That's what this whole case is about. And then being able to target in on cross-examining, frankly, the alienating parent. And that's where, uh, that's, that's when the mask tends to come off. And they may never, and they may continue to believe that they're victimized. That, that is that alienating parent, that's, it, it certainly can happen. Uh, and they will carry that the rest of their life sometimes. So once the, the court intervenes and in, in properly and, and had, is restores the other parent's relationship, then, you know, uh, it, it's not going, to, unfortunately, it doesn't tend to, to go away. What happens is children get older, and if they maintain a contact with that targeted parent, then it, it very often, it's, it will right itself, at least to some degree. I think in all cases, that there does, it does leave scar tissue. Uh, that, I mean, children that go through this really have a extra level, levels of experience that other, other children do not. And they carry that into you know, their life. Well, you know, um, I've been always, always a stand that what changes the course of things is that both parents are e on equal playing ground. Whereas, yeah. and I know that some, some judges have gone, they've, it's become so bad that a judge will actually switch custody and say, you know what, you're not allowed to have anything to do with that parent for like 90 days, whatever. Um, and it seems to have helped in the short term, but ultimately when the child gets exposed to the alienator again, there's a lot of guilt that shows up and it just gets reversed where um, I know it, and personally, um, it's been my experience that 50-50 gets the kids out of the middle of the crossfire. I think you can. I mean, you mentioned the 90 day thing. There are a couple of programs that specifically require that. And these are for severely alienated kids. The two programs are Family Bridges and Turning Points. And they basically require there to be a 90 day no contact directly or indirectly between the children and the, the alienating parent, which is very difficult to get a judge to agree upon. If you talk to Richard Warshak, who's involved in the creation of the Family Bridges program, he will describe, and it's in the literature, what happens is in the process that they go through, the child begins to realize that the other parent was saying negative things about the other parent that aren't true. And the, so they'll immediately start to be upset with the alienating parent. And what they do in those programs then is basically teach them not, not to counter alienate, but rather a lot of those in family bridges, especially has all kinds of resources that teach children that we as humans misperceive things all the time. We get things wrong all the time. It's kind of normal. That kind of gets the kid off the hook and they're no longer as much a co-conspirator as simply being mistaken and that seems to be a big important thing that does get these kids because if you talk to a an, a an adult who went through childhood like that like amy baker's work yeah the the amount of the amount of uh, guilt is is enormous so one of the ways we don't want the child to be alienated from the other parent we just want them to have the tools to be able to be independent and think for themselves which is what it gets attacked. That independent thought is what gets attacked with alienation. Children are actually punished for thinking independently. So it, what it, it's been, what I'm noticing too, is a lot of times people are always trying to diagnose. I mean, you have parents who are self-educated in this because it's yes. what you have to do. And they're all about, you know, they're, they're throwing around disorders and stuff like that to try to get some attention, but you know, they are not, an expert and so of course they're not listened to and a lot of times um, going the route of the of diagnosing can be the long road yes yes and make I, less I, effective. I, that's, that's a very good point I have sometimes and very often I mean I've got people right now that I had this conversation with just yesterday or we have to show that they're they they have a narcissistic personality disorder or something like that I have never found labeling someone with a diagnosis to be very moving to a judge. They'll go, oh yeah, so what? I mean, we've tried that. We've tried that in other cases years and years ago. It just never really, what really moves the needle for the judge is exposing the behavior. That's what really does it. And there are techniques that we've developed to be able to help to do that where, and, and I think uh, 
parents, the targeted parent, have to be kind of coached about how to tell the story, how to do it in a way that really activates, you know, the, our emotional system in our brain is the limbic system. And what we want to do is activate the judge's limbic system. So you have a, a parent pick out a specific incident that describes something and paint a picture of it. The judge can see it in, in their own mind's eye, so to speak, and then they're more likely uh, to really understand it. it resonates as opposed to saying, oh, she's borderline or she's narcissistic. That just doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't have much uh, impact. But describing behaviors uh, and having the, the targeted, uh, I'm sorry, the alienating parent, I mean, these parents, as I'm sure you'd all agree, lie about things and distort things all the time and exposing those things. And we will develop a thing called a lie list. Uh, it's a tool to basically go through systematically and expose these things, typically in cross-examination. And in the, in, the, in the real time of a court, when a parent who has one of these uh, disorders is exposed as lying, they don't react very well. And so the mask comes off. So that's kind of the formula that's been shown to work, but I couldn't agree more. It's really not diagnosing, you know, having a lay person or a professional person diagnose someone. I don't think that really moves the ball very far at all, if at all. It's just sort of a distraction. And no, I agree. And doctor, if I could, I think it's really important what you touched on. And I believe Dr. Evans did last week as well is um, we talked about a lot of times those reactions that a parent will have who's being alienated will mimic a lot of the things that the alienator said to look for. Yes. Because a lot of times when we, when we're, we feel like we're losing our kids, yeah. or yeah. being slandered, we tend to uh, panic, which which uh, mirrors a lot of those same reactions that the, the alienator for, you know, warned of. Now, so when I say that, I think it's important that people rise above it. The yes. only thing you can control, doctor, is your reaction. So you can't fight with someone not fighting with you. If someone's not there, you're swinging, you're swinging in the air. Yes. So rise above it and love your child more than you hate your ex and it, understand exactly what it is and be your child's best friend. Rise above that. Don't react. No, that's, that's very good and important advice because you're right. It, because of a, process, a, a phenomenon called confirmatory bias, the way our brains work, we don't like to be confused. We're going to put something in a category because we, we don't know how to interpret it. So if you've already been told, gee, this guy's out of control and he gets angry easily, and then kid, you know, and he's reacting reasonably because he's just lost his children, that it, the confirmatory bias tends to endorse that original interpretation. So you're right. I mean, so I'm always, okay, count to 10, take some breaths, don't answer questions too quickly, just be calm and rise above. I mean, that's very, very important because that's systemically that. Uh -oh. Hmm. parent at all it's about not displeasing the alienating parent i mean that's what drives this it's so much less about the targeted parent where all the focus is so once somebody really understands that uh on, on a fairly deep level it's a lot easier to rise above and not react which is important so that's a big part of what we do is just educate the parent who's going through this about the whole, how the, how the phenomenon works. That's awesome. I, uh, I know what you've been able to, you know, all of this is going to help these parents who are just grasping for, um, for something to hang on yeah. to, to, to keep them in the game, keep them in the game in the, in the court, keep them in the game with their child ultimately. Um, and that's why it is that you're going to be in, uh, one of our uh, wonderful speakers and presenters with Dr. Evans yes. uh, in the Guardians and Gatekeepers Conference uh, in April. Super yeah. excited for that. Well, likewise, Bob, Bob and I do a couple of the, you know, we've done things jointly before and I think it works out well because it's very conversational and keeps things kind of lively and a little more interesting and he reacts off of me and I react off him. It's never the same each time we do it, but, but it works out well. It's sort of like, I don't know what it's like, but it still works. It works out well. If yeah. there's one final message that ahead, you want to leave with, I know we're running, we're getting at the end here. And that is if there's one thing for an alien parent to understand, and that is when children 
do become, when I was doing evaluations, if you ask the right questions, you always get the same answer. And that, that if the children believe, come to believe that the uh, targeted parent doesn't love them or isn't capable of it. That's really important to understand because if you do understand that and then the child says, oh, or the, the other parent says, don't come to their soccer game. They don't want you here. You're very uncomfortable. If you do that, you're buying into, you're endorsing that idea of abandonment and lack of love. So you, I think it's very important for parents going through this to understand that one principle. I think that's, that's a guiding principle for how do you handle these situations is remember that. Put that in your back pocket and pull it out and look at it from time to time because that will guide how to deal with all the myriad thousands of circumstances that come up. Yes, and there's, there, are, there are several books out there from, um, di from your book that you wrote um, and several of them. Just read, 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 and, yes. um, and you know, use it as your tool, uh, you know, your uh, tool bag. And, yes. um, well, I mean, this, oh. is a, this is a, as a parent, this is a life-changing phenomenon, and I can't tell you. How many people, I think everybody on this <laughs> call can, you know, it's, it's really does change your life. You're not the same after this. And it, that doesn't, that starts out tragically, but it doesn't have to end that way. So it really it can be something that, you know, uh, tragedy sometimes can become really uh, positive things later on. So that's, that's the hope. I think Bud and I can relate to that. I think oh, that's why sure. we do what we do, right? We yes, sure exactly. can. Dr. Bowen, what a wonderful way to, to start, wrap up the show here. And I'll say, you know, even to the folks out there, and I know Dr. Bowden and Danica will concur, you hear a lot of people say, you know, they're, they're heartbroken when they hear their alienated child saying that they hate them. Right. Oh my God, my child, they do not hate you. They hate the situation. Children are innately love. They don't like the toxicity. They don't like the burden. They don't like the hate. They don't like the smearing. They love you innately. That can't be broken unless you allow it to be in the sense of feeding into that same toxicity. So yeah. love your child more than you hate your ex-partner. And again, that's not really difficult when you genuinely love a child. You want to see them raised in a different environment than you were if you went through that. You, yeah. you need a hero back then. Then don't repeat those cycles. Be your child's best friend. Be the hero that you always should have had for your child. Dr. Bone, incredible. Can't wait to meet you in Florida, Dr. Well, likewise. And that's a great, well, that's a great point right there. I'm, I think that's very, very important. I couldn't agree more. Mm -hmm. Okay, bud, we got to wrap the show up. Uh, unfortunately, because with Dr. Bone, we could talk with you like for oh, hours and hours. Why are you going on like this forever? <laughs> yes, well, and I can tell because see, Danica and I get so excited on the download, Doctor. Uh, after the shows, when they, it's a really good one, they generally always are. They get better and better, very organically. Uh, we'll probably talk uh, quite a bit after the show about this. And I know, as Danica said, we could talk for hours, yes. and we'll get to in Florida. Yeah, so exactly. Like Looking forward to it. <laughs> As am yes. I. Thank you to everybody out there. Thank you to Dr. Bone and thank you to Danica Joan, the host of Custody Matters Live, along with Bud Vito, February 26, 2020, exiting at about 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Chins up, everybody. It's not over till you say it's over. Go back and listen to Dr. Bone over and over and over and <laughs> over till you get it. Thank you, everybody. Much love. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And stay tuned next week for Custody Matters Live.